The doors to the Viridian Tea House are open once more. Hello everyone. I've got quite a bit to talk about today, so I don't have, oh, the only news that I do have before I get started is that October 7th, this Saturday, is the last day for the Golden Farmer's Market. Uh, I will be there with bells and whistles, with art, books, photography, and tea. So if you are able to come this Saturday, the hours I think are the usual eight to one. So stop on by and get your last minute fix on a really cool farmer's market. It has been a joy and a delight to be with them a third year. And um, it's been a great year. I mean, I, I, I can't really add anything else to it. All right, so let's get to the books. And both of these books are from Denver Public Library. So many thanks to Denver Public Library. Let me get the really controversial one out of the way first. So this is Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma by Claire Daterer. And I found out about her through, it was like an Instagram post or something like that involving her essay which started all of this uh what do we do with the art of monstrous men or something like that through uh the paris review if i remember correctly so i read it on my computer here in my office and i didn't move from my seat i read the entire article and i even reached out to the author and i said wow um i never thought of it like this and wow you're right <laughs> So I also watched her do a Zoom interview talking about the book and her um, research for the book and her own thoughts about the book. One thing about Monsters of Fans Dilemma is that she also talks about her personal life. So it just kind of meshes and melds and comes all together, basically asking the question, are we all monsters? And the short answer is yes. So let me just read the dust jacket for you. What do we do with the art of monstrous men? From the author of the New York Times bestseller, Poser, and the acclaimed memoir, Love and Trouble, a passionate, provocative, blisteringly smart interrogation of how we make and experience art in the age of hashtag me too, and of the link between genius and monstrosity. In this unflinching, deeply personal book, Claire Dederer asks, can we love the work of Hemingway, Polanski, Woody Allen, Miles Davis, or Picasso? Should we love it? How do we balance our undeniable moral outrage with our equally undeniable love of the work? In an age when the monstrousness of human behavior is on constant display, how do we retain our connection to the films, books, and music that have made us feel the most alive. This brilliant and electrifying book expands upon Dederer's instantly viral essay, What Do We Do With the Art of Monstrous Men, which shaped the conversation about art and mortality, morality, excuse me, and the psychic theater of public condemnation. With ferocious intelligence, extraordinary nuance, and a fan's reluctance to part with the works of art that have been foundational for her, Dederer clings in these pages, ambivalently at times, frequently, sorry, my glasses, <laughs> frequently comically, always with ardor to the art that she reveres. She resists pieties, wrestles with contradictions, and turns an unforgiving eye back on herself, looking with unmitigated candor at her own long-held secrets and at the monsters she has hidden in her own life. Wise, funny, ruthlessly honest, and destined to incite controversy and conversation, Monsters is a work of extraordinary urgency and erudition from a writer at the height of her powers. And Claire Dedder is, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, is the author of Love and Trouble and the New York Times bestselling memoir, Poser, My Life in 23 Yoga Poses, which has been translated into 11 languages. A book critic, essay, essayist, and reporter, Dederer is a longtime contributor to the New York Times and has also written for The Atlantic, Vogue, Slate, The Nation, and New York Magazine. She lives on her late father's houseboat in Seattle. So, let me tell you a story, personal story. Um, 
many, many, many years ago, uh, I think I was 13, I became obsessed with a certain actor. I will not say his name, but if you are interested, you can send me an email and ask me and I'll tell you. I became very obsessed with him. I watched him in a movie and it just blew my mind away. He was, he seemed intelligent, he was attractive, and he was way older than me. And I just knew that I was going to meet him one day. So I started watching all of his films and I just started loving him more and more and more to the point that I'll admit, I felt like I had a relationship with this guy. It's weird, I know, but you know, what are you gonna do? You're 13 years old. And as I got older, I still kind of held a little candle, a little flame for him, but it never died out. I just thought he hung the moon and the stars. Till one day after I became published and I started meeting famous people through the convention circuit, I found out that a convention I was going to do, he was going to be there. And I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be awesome. Well, circumstances prevented me from being a part of the convention, but one of my friends attended. So sometime later, I reached out to her and I said, hey, did you meet X? And she's like, yeah. And I thought, uh-oh. And she's like, yeah, he was an asshole to his fans. Like he wanted people, he would not take pictures with anyone unless they paid him. And at that moment, it was like somebody clicked the light switch off. I dropped my obsessive love for him, fangirl for him. And I, I mean, I still see his movies, but I look at him and I think, you're a monster. That was the first thing that came to mind. Well, a lot of things came to mind when I read this book, but that was the biggest story that came to mind that was personal. I get it. I really do. We, you know, yes, I read Hemingway. I love Picasso's artwork. I'm a big fan of Woody Allen. And I also hate him too. Um, but there are these creative people in our world who are dead or still living or what have you. And they have outlandish behavior. And we, the public, are just like, oh my God, you know, how, how, how can I love your work? And I know that you, you've done these things, you, you horrible, horrible person. And it's not just men, it's also women as well. How can we enjoy the art that these people give us if we know that they are monsters? How, how can we do this? So she spends the majority of the book talking about the different kinds of monsters and the different examples and the heinous activities that they engaged in. At the very end, I'll just read it for you. Let's see. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm trying to find it. Oh, basically put, what do we do about the terrible people in our lives? Mostly we keep loving them. Families are hard because they are the monsters and angels and everything in between that are foisted upon us. They're unchosen monsters. How random it all seems when you really consider it. And yet somehow we mostly end up loving our families anyway. Uh, let's see. Um, what do we do about the terrible people we love? That question comes with another question nestled inside of it. How awful can we be before people stop loving us? Uh, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, I I'm jumping around here. My apologies. Uh, love is not reliant on judgment, but on a decision to set judgment aside. Love is anarchy. Love is chaos. We don't love the deserving. We love flawed and imperfect human beings. In an emotional logic that belongs to an entirely different weather system than the chilly climate of reason. Pearl Cleage, in her older, mellower days, softened toward Miles, Miles Davis. She spoke of him with tenderness, with sadness, with feeling. We can just hope the next time he comes around, his spirit and his personality will be as lovely as his music. We can just hope. So basically, what do we do with the monsters and their art? We love them anyway. I have a problem with that.
I really do. Um, I, I know my, my boyfriend is a saint for listening to me because I read this book in a day and a half and there was like four or five hours at a stretch where I, I didn't leave my sitting position because I was just devouring this book. And I kept having all these questions and these thoughts about the monsters, about the Hemingways, the Picassos, the Virginia Woolfs, the uh, Doris Lessings, the Woody Allens, the Roman Polanskis, the Miles Davises. My thought is this. We see someone who is an artist, be they a writer, sculptor, painter, actor, actress, and we love what they do. And so some of us put them on a pedestal that's so far removed from the rest of the world that all they see are clouds and other people put on pedestals. We treat these people like gods. We treat these people like, oh, they can do no wrong until they actually do. And then when they fall, we're shocked, we're astounded, we're, we're conflicted, we're like, how can I love this actor if I heard that he beat his wife on an airplane because he was so drunk? That really did happen to a particular actor. I won't say who it was, but you probably know. She says we go on loving them anyway. My thought is this, stop treating certain people like they can do no wrong and recognize them for the human beings that they are. They're human. We're all human. We all F up. We all make mistakes. We all screw up. We all say the wrong thing. We all get our wrists slapped and sometimes more than that. But I never want to look at someone like an actor or a singer as a deity, as someone who I have to idolize. I don't want to do that. When I got published and I started doing conventions, I met a lot of famous, you know, big time names in the sci-fi fantasy, yeah, sci-fi fan fantasy realm. And after the initial two seconds of going, wow, I'm actually shaking so-and-so's hand, I was like, oh yeah, and you're human, okay. I met one particular author, won't say who he is, and he, he was shy. And I was like, oh, he's shy, okay. I didn't tremble. I didn't, you know, oh my God, I didn't grovel. I didn't do that. It lasted for about two seconds. Uh, there was another, a musician whom I met many years ago. And I talked to him for like a few seconds and I said, wow, it's a pleasure meeting you. And he kind of acted like a dick. And I was like, oh, why didn't that surprise me? And then I actually had a friend confirm and tell me, yeah, you know, he's kind of an asshole. But for me, what do I do with the monsters in my life? What do I do with the fact that, yes, I still watch Woody Allen films and I know the stories. I don't treat him like he's a deity. I treat him like he's a human being. That's it. Capable of making mistakes, capable of screwing up, but, and this is just me personally, I'm secure in my own awareness that I don't, I, oh God, I'm getting so tongue tied, I'm sorry, but just bear with me. I've had people come up to me and like shake and tremble sometimes. They're like, oh my God, you know, I love your books. You're so amazing. And I'm like, oh, thanks. I look at them as a human being, as am I. I don't want to be deified. I don't want to be placed on a pedestal. I, I just want to be Kimberly B. Richardson, owner of a tea company, a screw up, uh, flawed and loves to read and loves to play her violin, who lives in Colorado. That's all, I, ju I just want to live my life and have the self-awareness that I'm not putting people on pedestals so that when they fall, which they will, I'm not, so horrified that I think, but, but, but they can do no wrong. Actually, yes, they can. They bleed just like us. They put on their underwear just like us. They, they are us. So what do we do with the art of monstrous men? 
We love their art. We love what they created. But we also know that they're fallible. We also know that they're not perfect. And that makes me respect what they produce even more. Like sometimes, you know, I, I've had, I've had conflicting moments when I've tried to read a certain writer and I know that, you know, they were a Nazi sympathist or uh, sympathizer, excuse me, or they hated black people in their time or they hated Jews or they hated women or whatever. There's some authors I'm like, oh, I just can't read your work. I'm sorry. And others I'm like, you know, um, you were human. I'm human. We're all human. But I refuse to put anyone on a pedestal. I refuse to do that. I refuse to be horrified when I hear of some famous person or some author getting too big for their britches. It, it, I just shake my head and go, well, that's humanity for you. So anyway, I can go on and on, but this book really made me think, and I am grateful, so grateful for the chance to read this book. And I am glad that she wrote this book as well. Um, I looked at some of the reviews on Goodreads and a lot of people were, yay, thumbs up. This, this was, I needed to read this book. And a lot of people were like, uh, yeah, pass. I personally give it, Four pots of tea from Viridian Tea House. A strong, solid four. Um, Claire, if you're watching this video, thank you for writing this book. You have made me, you, you have opened my eyes to realizing, do I do this? And if so, I need to stop. But thank you so much. And I actually told two of my dearest friends about this book and I hope that they read it. And I, I would be really curious to hear their thoughts. And um, so yeah, this Monsters of Fans Dilemma, Four Pots of Tea from Viridian Tea House. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I talked 17 minutes about this book. <laughs> so the other book is, is, wow, I really talked a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I, I had a lot to think about and to process about reading that book and I'm still kind of processing a little bit. So yeah, I rambled. I'm human. This book, a delightful, exquisite, fully charged, erotic graphic novel, A Nice Nin, A Sea of Lies by Leonie Bischoff. Exquisite illustrations. Um, I'll just read the back of it for you. I will never write like a man. I will write like a woman. I will express the inexpressible, intuitions, quiverings. I will make of my life a masterpiece and invent a language to tell it. Anais Nin is the patron saint of sexual iconoclasts. She was a prolific diarist, novelist, essayist, and one of the most famous and best-selling authors of literary erotica, Delta of Venus, Little Birds. I think I've, I've read Delta of Venus. It's, oof. For nearly a, cent nearly a century, she's been inspiring taboo-breaking artists like Madonna and Leonie Bischoff, whose mesmerizing graphic biography, A Nice Nin, A Sea of Lies, won an international prize. In 1930s Paris, Anais Nin wants nothing more than to write, but is frustrated by her inability to express the inexpressible. She meets the young American writer, Henry Miller, and her passions are inflamed by his wife, June. She proceeds to have torrid affairs with Henry and others. Erotic experiences brought to vivid, transcendent life through Bischoff's sensual color lines and discovers that her sexual liberation also frees her as an author. Nin lived her life like a work of art and created art from her life. Leonie Bischoff brings it full circle by illuminating Nin's inner complexity in this uncompromising work of art. It was truly a work of art to read this illustrated graphic or illustrated novel regarding an author that I truly do admire. Um, I love the illustrations. I love how she conveys the, frust 
the frustration, the wanting to create, wanting to speak her words, but not sure how to do it. Like, and then this is some of the safer illustrations, but you can just see just absolutely beautiful, truly, truly beautiful work in this book. And this is one that I've checked it out, but I really, really, really would like to have a copy of this for myself. But if you are interested in a nice nun's life, or you've always wanted to read about her life, or you've read her erotica or her other works, A Sea of Lies is your next step. You really do need to check this book out. And this does receive five pots of tea from Viridian Tea House. Like I said, this was exquisite, erotic, fully charged, creative burst. Like I, as soon as I devoured it, I handed it to my boyfriend because he's read some of her work. And I said, you just need to read it. You really do. But yes, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, if you are so inclined to read this book, then please start reading her other work as well. And also regarding Henry Miller, I know he was very controversial and a lot of people didn't care for his work. I read um, Tropic of Cancer and I was like, whoa, I'm, wow, I feel really enlightened and I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> but yeah, Henry Miller, A Nice Nin, just electrifying work, sensual, just absolutely brilliant really brilliant. So many thanks for this book, A Sea of Lies. All right, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about this. So instead of the tea portion, we're going back to coffee. This is the original dark roast of Lion's Brew. Now, if y'all remember some time ago, I did the Jamaican waves for this company. Well, I spoke with one of the owner's friends and he said that, oh, she watched your video and she she loved it so much. So here I am back again drinking, excuse me, the original dark roast. And the ingredients are organic dandelion root, organic chicory root, organic, organic carrot bean, uh, natural color and flavors, organic lion's mane mushroom, organic maitake mushroom, organic MCT oil, and an organic Maya nut. Um, I've talked about this company before, but yes, this is a coffee alternative company. So if you like the taste of coffee, but you just don't want the jitters or what have you, you really need to try Lion's Brew. And actually, um, during the last Wheat Ridge Farmer's Market, I tried chilled, uh, what was it, the French vanilla, and it was absolutely heavenly. It was truly, truly heavenly. So here is my dark roast. I used a French press for about five minutes, and it's probably a lot cooler than, <laughs> than I made it because I did talk a lot. So this is the, once again, organic, original dark roast from Lion's Brew. That's really smooth. You know, sometimes when I think dark roast, I'm like, oh God, this is gonna like wrench my soul out of my body. But this is actually quite smooth. This is very smooth. Mm. Now I just made, it's just black. I didn't add anything to it. Slight hint of sweetness, but very smooth. Very delicious. Now, having, now that I've tried the Jamaican Waves and the Dark Rose, I'm going to have to say I like the Jamaican Waves just a little, little bit better. I don't know what it was, but this is quite good. I just, I keep saying this, but I can't get over the fact that how smooth it is. Like, this is just black coffee, but incredibly smooth, incredibly delicious, full of flavor. Yeah, this is excellent. If you're watching this, this is excellent. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I crack myself up. <laughs> anyway, 
before we get to meditating, and then I wish you all a fond farewell, I do want to talk about two really cool things that I, well, one I've already known about and the other one I just recently discovered. So this is cassava berry. For those of you who are sensitive to gluten, she makes a lot of, uh, let's see, I think, I think it's brownies, cookie mix, and tortilla mix that are, let's see, they're gluten-free and something else free, I can't remember. But this was the almond flour pumpkin spice brownie mix, and I made this for my boyfriend. Uh, the ingredients are coconut sugar, almond flour, pumpkin powder, uh, cassava flour, pumpkin pie spice, which was cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, allspice, baking soda, ground chia seed, Himalayan salt, and uh, let's see, it's organic, non-GMO, and it contains almonds and coconut. The directions, you you just add coconut, uh, excuse me, uh, virgin coconut oil, vanilla, and water to the mixture. And I will say, it had a really good flavor to it. I unfortunately, because whenever I think of brownies, I think, you know, the Pillsbury Doughboy and the really thick brownies, these were not as thick, but it had a really good flavor to them. Um, I like the little chewy consistency of the brownies. So if you are allergic to glutens or you're looking for alternative baking goodies, this is cassava berry almond flour pumpkin spice brownie mix. And I'll include the website on the video. So go check them out. Really nice lady too. She's really nice. And now the thing that I have already known about, but I just wanted to show to you guys. So this is Spider Witch Tea. This is one of the tea blends that I make in my company. And it is Assam Tea, which is a black tea from India, Hawthorne Berries and Anise. And the inspiration behind this are the delightful books, The Lost Daughter of Asa and Return to Asa by J.L. Mulva Hill. These are the first two books and the Elsie Lind Chronicles. Um, I know Jen has copies of the books. If you reach out to her, you can order them from her. Or you can also order these books. This is the first one and the second one through my Etsy store. And the tea blend inspired by the evil person in, in, the, um, in the series. So Spider Witch Tea Blend made by me, Viridian Tea Company inspired by J.L. Mulvihill's books. I keep figuring out which one's right. The Lost Daughter of Asa and Return to Asa. Available through me in my Etsy store or through Miss Mulvihill. Hi, Jen. All right, so now I am ready to wrap up this video. But uh, before we do, let's do a meditation. So this time, normally I do breathing meditations, but on my walk today around the lake, I thought, I wanna pose a question to y'all as you meditate. So, you know the usual, make sure you have a glass of water or a cup of tea nearby. Focus on your breathing, but I want you to think about this question. What brings you joy? That's it. What brings you joy? and just think about it. Once the video has uploaded, comment on what brings you joy. I'm gonna choose three random people and those three random people will receive a sample of one of my tea blends. So the question again is, what brings you joy? I'll choose three at random and you're gonna get some tea from me. So if you are ready to meditate, let's begin.
And now let's end this meditation with a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. Slowly open your eyes or allow your eyes to come back into focus. And now let's have a sip of your liquid refreshment. Still smooth and still delicious. So what brings me joy? One of the things that brings me joy is sitting on the couch with a good thick book and it's chilly outside, like it's getting chilly out here in Colorado. And I have a nice thick blanket around my legs, but still allowing me a little bit of movement. And I have a huge cup of tea next to me. And I know that I will not be disturbed for several hours. That brings me joy. So once again, whatever you think brings you joy, please comment in this video. I will choose three random people and they will receive a free sampler bag of tea. So that's all I have today. Many thanks to Claire Detter and Leonie Bischoff, to the folks at Cassava Berry, to my good friend JL Mulvihill for her wonderful books, and to y'all, oh, and also to the folks at the Lions Brew, and to y'all for watching these videos. They're not edited. They're goofy and silly, but dang it, I really enjoy doing these. I cannot believe, I think I've done like 109 videos. I'm just like mind blown. But thank y'all so much for continuing to watch these videos and saying, you know, what's she going to talk about today? It's like, I don't even know half the time. <laughs> but take care of yourself and each other. Raise your teacup or coffee cup high. And remember that to drink tea <laughs> is to enjoy life. I will see y'all real soon. Bye for now.